From beautiful downtown Mundelein, the heart of the Midwest region, it's the Bert Fishman Show, featuring Captain Ruoff. And tonight you're going to hear all about how to be a great mentor and give terrific, helpful feedback at the sessions you'll run at LDI 2017. And for the speakers, we got some stuff for you too. So hang on. <laughs> Okay, good evening, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you by Zoom tonight. And uh, we're going to do some work on giving you some of the finer points of being a good mentor slash good host or good chair. And uh, for those of you who are going to be the participants uh, presenting, uh, we're going to give you a lot of tips as well. So the first part of my talk will deal with uh, the mentoring part of, part of it how to set up the show, how to set up your program. And then the latter part, we'll talk about constructive things that um, uh, the mentors who are the hosts of the respective sessions will have little things to say, and uh, your speakers will have stuff to say as well. And I'm not gonna overkill, I'm gonna give you some basic things. We're talking about five minute presentations or four, as the case may be. So uh, we're gonna be, give you down home things that I hope you'll be able to use and remember. So from the top, to be a professional, we could have a whole talk about that. Be a professional, but we know a good professional, doctor, lawyer, and doing chief, prepares before the fact. So there's some things that uh, those of you who are mentors ought to do. And for one, one thing, you need to confer with your colleague before you even get there. And uh, you want to be, uh, be aware, you want to be able to verbalize uh, your colleagues. Uh, of course, you know his name, you may, may know a long time, but you may not know his region, or you may not know his current FJM title, FJMC title. So you want to get that, uh, that down as well. Secondly, uh, be a good idea before you start, I would suggest that you look over the participants that are going to be in your, that are going to be in your session. Uh, most of the names are easy to pronounce, uh, Steve Dix, uh, Bert Fishman, Bob Jones. Occasionally you have somebody uh, who might have a, a ethnic name, Russian, etc. And uh, if you spot one on the list, find out how to pronounce it if it's not comfortable saying it to you, saying it aloud yourself. Okay, setting up the room at LDI. I'm going to teach a little bit about what they call proxemics. What does proxemics mean? Proxemics has to do with relationships of people and things. And that's a very useful communication uh, technical term. So uh, in terms of the room, uh, here's a story. You never know what you're gonna find in a room and you always wanna go and check in early. Sometimes, typically our guys will leave a room neat and orderly ready for the next group, but sometimes I've come into uh, to sessions, followed somebody up, and it's utter chaos, so you want to be ready for them. Now, there's two basic setups, and I want to give you some uh, thoughts on the matter. Number one, classroom or auditorium style. Technically, you come in, and the rooms are set up very nicely, all the chair, chairs in a row, a couple of them are out of order. You make it nice and neat, and uh, you have an orderly classroom kind of or auditorium style uh, setup of the chairs. Uh, one nice touch, if the room will allow for it, is to curve it a little bit, a, a, a slight semicircle. And the reason being, the guy on one end and the guy on the other end, they come in a little closer to the center. And uh, years of experience watching it done, handling it myself, it adds a little comfort level for the, both the speaker and the audience. Not a requirement, but a slight, just a slight semicircle is a good idea. Another thing you want to uh, be cognizant of uh, and you're responsible for uh, mentors is a lectern. Now very often they will have a lectern right in the room, uh, floor up to um, chest level. And if they have one, well, that's just great. Sometimes they'll have a, 
what I call a half lectern you'll need a table to put that on and uh, you want to have a lectern for the speaker and uh, if there's not one uh, when I do a session myself I'm a stickler I'd like to have a lectern for the guys I can't find it in another room I will improvise I very often have gone into the kitchen and asked them for a an off carton from that was uh, used to hold cans and improvise and make that maybe you can put a white cloth over it and make that uh, into a lectern on top of a tabletop. And the reason I uh, encourage the uh, the lectern, very specific reason, you want the guys to be as comfortable as possible. And when they're up here getting ready to give a speech, and the table is down there, if they're using notes, and even though it's five minutes, it's perfectly legitimate to have a. a set of notes or a few bullet points uh, they don't have to keep they don't have to bend over lean over to take a look at the notes the other thing that happens and we'll talk about this uh especially for our speakers on the subject of uh gestures once there's a tendency it's an odd phenomenon once guys touch the desk or touch the table and sometimes even the lectern the hands get frozen there and when the hands get frozen there they don't the uh, they could get very stiff and they don't gesture. They really want to say, I have one, I have two, I have three points I want to make, or this was up or this was down. But when your hands are on the table or on uh, frozen there, uh, you don't have that same freedom. So that's the reason I like lectern, half lectern, or improvise is a nice touch. Okay, so that's, we talked about classroom setup. B. The A is classroom setup or audience style. B is table. Sometimes you'll come into a room and they've got tables there. Well, there's nothing wrong. Whatever they have, uh, you're a pro, you'll work with it. Now, the way to work with tables is you set up a U. You go one. And um, the lectern, the table, or whatever is up front in the center. Sometimes there's enough tables, you'll make a square of four. And the uh, thing you have to keep an eye on is when the guys come in, you want to make sure both in the audience and in the uh, audience style and in the uh, table setup, uh, you want the guys evenly distributed uh, around the group. For example, if you're, if you're doing a table setup, which is perfectly fine, uh, you'll, uh, if you've got 18 guys in your session, so you want to have six down the side, six across the back and another six over here on the other on the other side. That little balance is part of proxemics. It allows for a little comfort and uh, it helps everybody get going. Now, the arrival of the speakers, uh, they will know, especially the guys who have been on this call and on this session, they'll know that they shouldn't all crowd to one side. I've been to, I've showed up at the start of countless sessions and not being told, you'll see, 10 guys on one guy on one side and two on the other side. And you, of course, you don't want that, so you want to balance. So either if the participants don't get the idea on their own, whether it's classroom or the tables, you want a nice, even, symmetrical group. And that ends to a positive ambiance for your speakers. Okay? So that's a little bit about uh, uh, proxemics. Now let's start the program. We have two mentors. They're up front and they stand. I want to say a few words about standing. Um, every, you only want one, the speaker, or in this case, starting out the program, you want the mentor to be standing. Nobody else should be standing. Sometimes people will visit your session and stand in the back. That's intimidating for, for guys whose uh, ego, whose confidence you want to build. Nobody should be standing. And additionally, I want to mention this. Occasionally, somebody, you could be the most uh, sophisticated volunteer we have on board, but you just haven't run these kind of sessions. And uh, inadvertently, uh, you let everybody stand, and you call on a guy to give a talk, and he's seated. No, a big N, O. Don't let people stand when they're supposed to speak, because it inhibits them. You'll find the voices at a lower level. They don't use their full energy. They don't gesture, etc. So. Uh, I've tried it well. when I first started that I, many, many moons ago, more like eons, uh, when uh, I've had guys get up, they've got to stand, and then they put their, their body language gets going, they get the words, they get the presentation, they're doing the thing very, very nicely. So that's it. So now you want to get started. 
And so um, you were addressing the guys, either of the two mentors, and you tell them, uh, give them a short, sweet statement about the purpose of the session. Welcome to our session. And you tell them, gentlemen, we have three purposes here uh, in our session. Number one, we want you to learn more about HAMC's products, services, programs, initiatives, and other things that we do to enrich your understanding of what FJMC is all about. And secondly, of course, all right. So one of the two mentors will start out. Everybody's seated, two mentors in the front of the room. And uh, one takes control and say, uh, as I say, you're saying the, saying the purpose that uh, one is to learn FJMC, et cetera, as I said. And secondly, you want all the you're here to learn more about skills, and that's what we're about. And third, we like to tack that on the end. We want you to have some fun, just as hopefully we'll have a little fun learning about whatever we cover this evening. And then uh, you tell them that each speaker is going to be speaking for, you'll just remind them, the number of minutes. Okay, yeah. so men mentors, you're cranking up the session. You've got your... You told them nice to speak, and then you tell them, and we're also going to give you some feedback after to help you out at the end of your presentation. And so uh, that you're off and running, and one of the uh, mentors will introduce the first speaker. You might just say his name, and if you know his region, that's a nice touch. And uh, both mentors move to the back of the room, and you sit the. Uh, 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 inconspicuously along with the eyes in the back of the room. Now, after each, after each speaker presents, it's always nice to have a little applause. Again, I've tested it out 35 years when I started, and there's nothing like a little applause. After all, the guys worked hard and put together his presentation, five minutes or whatever it is, so you give them a little applause. That's motivational. And uh, the speaker then sits down and the mentors staying in the back of the room provide a few positive things that they observed about the presenter. Now I want to say a, a word or two about feedback. Feedback is a hot word. I was talking to some business people. Everybody, it's a, it's a buzzword, feedback. People need feedback to improve. So, uh, however, there's one little caveat. We've had the experience at LDI uh, not not uh, largely, but on a few occasions, uh, whoever hosted, whoever managed the learning skills session allowed the negative side of feedback to go on too long. We don't want that to happen. You don't want to send these guys home disillusioned or uh, feeling bad either when they put all this work in a presentation. So I'm going to give you the following caveat or and guidelines, if you will. Guy finishes, he gets his applause, he sits down, and you're... You're right in the room. Uh, the two uh, mentors immediately give the guys some positive feedback, something about their eye contact was good with the audience, or they're enthusiastic, or they were, the presentation was really interesting and original. So you say something positive. Now, it's a little unrealistic uh, to send, every, send these guys back to their seat after the presentation and say, nada, nothing at all beyond that. Uh, you will polish. We have guys that show up who are seasoned lawyers and they just got active as emerging leaders and a guy will come up there and give you a polished presentation you could frame, you could record, or a, a, a sales manager who does this stuff every day of the week and he comes at the old LDI, uh, a newcomer, and he does beautifully. But nine out of ten guys can use a little positive feedback. So what you do is you give him his positive stroke, something nice that you liked about the presentation, at least a few comments, and I'll give you the, what to say and ideas a little later on. Um, but that you, what you can say at the end is, Joe Blow did a, a beautiful job. What a nice presentation. Now, guys, if Joe does his presentation again somewhere else, um, what one thing would you suggest that might enhance his presentation? Period. Ba boom. So you haven't killed the guy, but we all need to improve uh, across the board, yours truly as well as, as much as anybody else. So you, uh, somebody comes up in the audience, one of the guys says, well, he could have been a little louder or a little more enthusiastic or whatever. Boom, you're done, you go on and introduce the next guy. So you keep the thing moving. I, by the way, I, 
I don't know if I made that comment, but uh, when you run sessions, be very, very cautious about doing one of these things. Uh, it's okay at, uh, what do they call it? Uh, rapid engagement sessions, that's what I was trying to think of. Uh, at a rapid engagement or an icebreaker, they have each guy introduce himself. Avoid doing that. Guys often come out of the sessions where they go names, names, names. They lost 15, 20 minutes and uh, they resent the loss of time. So be cautious and concise on the introduction. So we give the guy positive strokes and a little constructive suggestion to improve in the future. Now who can quarrel with that? Well, let's see what whatever else we want to say. So that's, that's uh, basically the, what we want to keep in mind as uh, mentors. And now, additionally, I do want to make one other point. Since we're being uh, respectful and careful not to offend anybody to use uh, the feedback mainly for positive strokes and a little something constructive at the end, please tell the guys, because uh, when you work at a presentation, particularly with some of the guys in new, uh, uh, they may want uh, a lot more than they got in the session. So please point out to them and say, fellas, uh, after the session, if you'd like to hang around, or if you'd like to talk to either of your two mentors here, we'll be happy to talk to you more at length about your presentation and uh, a little more about what was good and what might be improved. So uh, please keep that in mind. Cool, so that's basically uh, the deal on what to expect if you're a speaker, what to expect from the mentors, and mentors, I hope that gives you a little idea. Uh, intuitively, I'm sure uh, we weren't born yesterday. Uh, we have a very sophisticated uh, volunteer corps at FJMC. Nonetheless, having it laid out, as I've done, perhaps uh, overly so, simplistically, if you will, but now you know, just what to do when you jump to it and make it happen. Now, so we, we've gone about 20 minutes or so talking about the mentor's role. And what I'm gonna do now is go back to basics. I'm gonna go over some public speaking principles and which provide you with the basics uh, for feedback and constructive speaking for presentations or when we say it more formally, public speaking. It's all the same. So. Here are some things we might talk about. Number one, knowledge. Knowledge is power. That's the word that got me so fired up a long time ago. I don't think uh, if it weren't for that wonderful saying by Francis Bacon, knowledge is power. That's really fired me up about learning and wanting to uh, uh, follow through on my degrees. Now, what does that mean when you're giving a presentation? It means, uh, you don't take something verbatim off a website. Now you could you could very easily do that, and, and largely it might go, go go unnoticed. But when you take just something out of a manual to deal with your respective topic, or just something off a website, or just something flat out of Google, uh, you've read one article and you make five minutes out of that. It doesn't it doesn't spell knowledge. There has to be more into it. You need to interact with other people. You need to do a little research that involves more than one person. In my own case here, I, the, I find that the more time I put in preparation, uh, the, the more comfortable and the more, there's my key word, knowledgeable I feel. So I would suggest to uh, you, uh, for, for openers, what I did when Doug called me up to do this talk, I. Uh, <laughs> I took an hour out of his law firm's term uh, billing time and I had him uh, wait while I jotted down notes and ideas I had for this talk and much of which I've already said. And I took a lot of notes and I made another call. I called Alan Cahan. I was very perceptive on communication, what goes into it. And after talking to two guys, a little poking around, and I wrote out the comments that I, uh, that I made the, this evening for you. And I hope it comes across as knowledge. And yet, I went through all the processes of talking to people and I wrote out every word. I typed it all up. And uh, that gives me a handle on what I'm saying. And uh, so that's just a thought 
But I'll make one other point, and this is not to kill the little Lily, but my job here is to be a teacher and to be your professor. As an example, you'll have to be the judge. The LDI team asked me to talk about listening skills, which I am slated to do. I'm going to do a video, and I'm going to do a live presentation, November 20, 220 in the afternoon at LDI on listening skills. My goodness gracious. I have written three books on communication, and each of them has pages or sections on listening skills. And most of these, I was a professor for 35 years, were written years ago. Now, did I go to that step? No, I did not. Where did I go? I went to Google and I printed out eight different articles, at least, like maybe a few more, on the topic of listening. I want to take a fresh look at it, see if I can come up with some good ideas. I'm not going to be talking all night. I'm only going to do about a 15 minute, 20 minute presentation, but I got some fresh material. And uh, the, thing, the thing about this, to make a long story short, on the topic of, of knowledge is that when you only go to a narrow source and don't discuss it with anyone, the presentation is likely to come across in what I call one dimension. Whenever possible, and this is certainly possible for you, you want to have at least at least three different things that you've gone to, people you've spoken to, and sources on the net, et cetera, to give you some, uh, some rounded knowledge on your topic. Period, paragraph on the topic of knowledge. Now, public speaking and presentation skills uh, can be divided into two parts. And the two parts that can be divided into are what is said or the content and how it's said or the style. So that's what we're going to work on a little bit now. Uh, I'm not going to go at great length, though I'd rather hear some of your questions. Uh, you may want to ask, uh, when, we, uh, when we go through this particular section, we may, may want to talk about notes and uh, uh, nervousness and some other topics. Each audience is different and want to see where your interest lies. Okay, so we talked a little bit about knowledge, now content. When we talk about content, uh, I mean, we got to be fair, this is only five minutes, so we can't go nuts. So uh, you're going 20 minutes, 30 minutes, a beginning, middle, and end, and that's the traditional way of uh, talking about a presentation. Uh, but uh, beginning, middle, end, or introduction, body, conclusion. Uh, so we wouldn't be that finite in our analysis of what you're doing, nor should you be uh, either. But uh, Two tips to make your presentation stand out. Give your, your first sentence a little zest. So you might say, gentlemen, I have a program which will bring your club to life in ways you won't imagine. Or I have a program that will really do wonders for your region. So you come out a little stronger. It could be a question, it could be a statement. And at the close, at the end of your five minutes, say, I told you I had something for, special for you. I'll that you found it interesting and that you will give it a try when you go back to your region. So that's a little bit about organization. It should have a sense of beginning, middle, and end, even with five minutes. And if you bang out a little bit more at the opening, a little more zest on the close, that gives this feeling, this feeling uh, that there is a beginning, middle, and end to it. Let's uh, next a word or two about language. If there are uh, or any words you're going to use Hebrew, uh, you you don't use Shabbat and Shabbos in the same way. Shabbos, the Yiddish form, and, uh, uh, and conservative literature with modern Hebrew, Shabbat. So if you're using any Hebrew word, pronouncing it correctly, saying it appropriately is something you want to keep in mind under the topic of language. And then simply being articulate. Uh, so mentors, you want to your comment might be that the guy was a little muddled and he wasn't as clear as he could have been. Uh, or you could praise him. Kind of contrary, uh, on the contrary, you might praise him for the fact that he was particularly articulate. Next, next we want to talk about speech value. And that, in talking about speech value, we talk about interest. Was the topic interesting? And even if it wasn't so interesting, did he make it? Interesting. That's a plot that you might give the guy. Was there something original about it? Is it something uh, that's another thing? I did the Johnny Carson thing for openers. I just wasn't going to do 
jokes today as I often do, but just a little something different. And I thought that ho hopefully that made you smile or say, hey, this is going to be just a little something different from Captain Rourke. So in your talk, something just a little off the beaten track in the way you uh, phrase something, in the way you say something adds to the speech's value. So we talked about knowledge, we talked about content, what it said. Now I want to go into some of the particulars regarding uh, how it is said, and that's style. First, voice. This is a beautiful instrument that you have. We don't think much about it on our day-to-day -day basis, but how you sound to others is something we need to think about when we want to improve our public speaking or our presentation skills. So uh, I highly recommend it, as a matter of fact, in answer the to the question you might have about uh, what makes you what makes you nervous and how do we overcome it? If you have any kind of recording equipment, uh, I would record my presentation. Um, and there's two reasons you want to do it. Number one, you record it; it helps you remember. And I might add here parenthetically, everything I'm saying tonight, I have recorded. It comes across, I hope, in a spontaneous fashion. I'm making that point. To, your edification because I'm not reading and I want to be more natural and spontaneous. Nonetheless, a good part of this thing, particularly the first part, I tape it. I have already taped the 15, 20 minutes that I'm going to do for LDI on listening. When you listen to it, you could play, uh, depending on the equipment I have, <laughs> uh, 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 during uh, Abraham Lincoln's day, when Radio Shack was still in business, I had one of these nice little tape players. It's antiquated, but it works beautifully for me. I tape record everything I do, everything, every speech one, regardless of the topic, and it helps me, number one, keep an eye on, uh, keep an ear on, if you will, on how I sound, both to myself. That's often very, that can be very disillusioning to uh, a newer speaker, and even the seasoned speaker are sometimes bumped by that. They hear themselves on a recording and they say, oi, do I sound like that? Well, you do, but you've got to listen to it regularly and maybe you can uh, enhance your voice. Even like the old time, I like to do this too. The old uh, radio broadcasters were satirized by cupping their ears and listening to how they sound. And that works and that's helpful. So you want to be cognizant of the kind of voice that you have and if possible, we're not uh, this is not a voice class and it's not a singing class, but the quality of your voice is something we can think about. Next, volume. How loud are you? Uh, typically, uh, new speakers will speak too softly. And uh, a good practice to look at the back of the room and uh, you're, catch your eye on one or two guys and you could even ask them, can you hear me okay in the back? That's an old joke. I say, can you hear me in the back? You know. But uh, you, do to, uh, you do want to know as a speaker that they do hear you and, and they're comfortable, comfortable hearing you. So uh, uh, you can kind of watch them, keep an eye on them and see if they're alert. <laughs> they haven't gone to sleep on you and then you know your voice is good. Uh, um, the quality of your voice, we talked about that. I want to say a word or two about pacing. Uh, a very common mistake over the years in my my years in this business, it's one of the biggest uh, and most common mistakes is uh, pacing. Guys, when, uh, particularly when they're new, they tend to talk too fast. Like, uh, uh, sometimes when you don't have the experience of being up regularly, that's why this is a great opportunity for all of you. The more you front, the more this kind of talk that I'm sharing you uh, uh, will have uh, meaning. So. Uh, you pace yourself in a nice, even way, speaking at a good volume, and occasionally you pause. Uh, we do what we call the, the pregnant pause. You know. Can we ever forget the six million? Pause there. When you pause after such, probably the most powerful question I could ask, or that drives that thought home. And I've had speakers that I've been happy to co coach and correct who talked about the Yellow Candle program and the six million 
and they went 90 miles an hour. So, whoa, 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 whoa. This is powerful stuff. Pause from time to time. I will often on my copy, whether it's five minutes or 50 minutes, occasionally I'll write down and put on my notes, pause. And that gives the audience a chance to breathe. So you don't have to go ba bam, ba bam, ba bam, ba bam, ba bam. A little pause from time to time. Next, let's talk a little bit about the physical. And uh, the physical, the first thing I would mention is gestures. Now, you, you've been watching me here, what is it, about 30, 35 minutes, and you see occasionally I'll, I'll make this point or the other point. And uh, how you do that is you free your hands. That's why I, I um, emphasized earlier that you want to have a lectern up front, even an improvised box, as I suggested. When your hands are free, it's very, very natural. Uh, if I ask you, which way is up? You know, which way is down? How many points do you want to make? I want to make three points. Now, when your hands are locked on the lectern, your hands are in your pockets, which is uh, just a death wish for a good speaker. And your hands are really there doing anything else. Uh, you're not free to gesture. My suggestion is to, to do what I call keep your hands in neutral speakers. And this applies to the our, our mentors and your speaking. You don't want to be leaning on the wall or touching anything else. You touch nada, nothing. Hands at your sides and the occasion or the reason to invite the next speaker to make the next point. Your hands will do what hands are designed to do and that is to enhance your communication and hear your speaking and your presentation. So gestures. Next thing I want to say a word or two about is eye contact. I can see you out there. Eye contact in American culture is telltale. And then when you, uh, I did that for 35 years, groom people, the age of anybody out here in grad school and undergraduate, role playing an interview and making sure that in our culture, shake hands and eye contact in an appropriate way. That's not true, true in all cultures, but that, which is very, very interesting, but let's focus on where we're going. So eye contact, now there's a couple of parameters, a couple of tips on eye contact. That's a, for some people, uh, for all of us in a way, it's hard to get a grab. I'm going to give you something simple and solid on the topic of eye contact. And here it is. Think of your audience as in three parts. Regardless of whether we have an audience set up there as we talked about classroom style, or we have the tables around the room. Think of your audience as being left, right, excuse me, left, center, right. Now, right, center, left. Now, you handled contact. I'm sure if, uh, if I ask you to raise your hands, I'm sure everybody, almost everybody, has been in theater in the round. Now, how do they do it? They do it and they make it interesting for everybody in the challenging environment of the uh, uh, theater in the round, they do it by making their movements very, very gradual. And so you're never conscious, uh, not in the hands of good actors and good directors, that there's uh, this business of eye contact. So uh, similarly for us, uh, you start out looking at the center, the guy in the back of the room, if it feels uncomfortable, and it does even for me. Somebody's got a, a funny punum or whatever, you just don't want to look at the guy directly. You can look at a, I'm talking about my hairline. My hair's coming back, guys, don't get excited. But my doctor told me it's coming back red, so you'll have to wait and see next year. In any event, you look at the guy in the back of the room, and you look at his hairline or his eyes, but you don't linger, otherwise it's uncomfortable for you and for him. And so you gradually, you look around the room and over, over to the left, and you look at somebody over there, and then you pivot very, very naturally over to the center, and occasionally over here. Nothing conscious, nothing exaggerated, but there's a movement of your eyes, and what that does is that it gauges the audience and they feel that they belong and they feel that they're talking. If your eye contact is solid mahogany, and you follow what I am telling you, the people will not go to sleep on you. Uh, they have the feeling that you really are talking to each and every one of them. 
uh, individually. And that's a phenomenon that just works. So physical, that's our gestures, that's our eye contact. And I just want to say a few words about uh, manner, and then uh, we have a little time, we can have a few questions. I'll just say a little word, a few words about poise, confidence, and enthusiasm. So the first one, poise. Uh, why would a mentor say about one of you guys who are presented, the guy was absolutely poised. He will say that about you because you look like you belong in front of the room giving a presentation. Get that? That's the goal for everybody here. You want to learn to look like you belong up front. I mean, you can say you're a leader, an emerging leader, but you look like you belong up front. The way you get that is by practicing the way you want to look. When you practice, don't, when you got to practice, the place to practice is in front of a mirror. And then you can also practice in front of the wife or a buddy or whoever else. But your mirror, the mirror is your best friend. When you're practicing, you don't want to be scratching your hair or your hair or digging for gold. When you do those kind of things, I mean, occasionally, I'm sure if you watch me for the full 40 minutes, you'll see me maybe scratch or reach a little something and nothing. With a theme song, you watch Johnny Carson. He, got, he does a lot of itching and fetching, but it doesn't distract the audience because he's so head on focused on his humor. So uh, you look poised because you look like you belong there giving the speech that you're going to give, give at the right guy at the right time giving that talk. Confidence uh, is a little more internal. It's related very much to uh, poise. And it means you have a positive attitude. You know you've got a good topic. You know you're prepared. Uh, and by goodness, it's a good topic you're going to get. It's going to be great. You're going to do it for five minutes or whatever. And they're going to like it. They don't like it. That's their mistake. It's good. And you are good. And that's the way you got to go at it. Poise, confidence. And the last one I'll mention very briefly is it's the ultimate saver. Uh, and that is enthusiasm. If you're not enthusiastic, I mean, I could tell you all, all kinds of bubblemizers are about present challenges and that I happen, I happen to be going through, and uh, but I ain't. All you want to know is, am I enthusiastic about what I'm saying here and now? And it's amazing. People will forgive, forgive you. The guys worry too much about a perfectly delivered line on whatever subject it is getting that speech perfect. Know it, learn it, practice it, go through the steps I suggested. But if you're enthusiastic, even if you flub the dub, you repeat words, you repeat ideas, guys will draw out uh, that honest enthusiasm. And uh, you know, the, I, I love the explanation I, I picked up from a wonderful speaker by the name of Zig Ziglar. And he said that, don't forget, enthusiasm comes from the Greek and Theos, God within. So you really believe in yourself, you believe in your topic, your honest enthusiasm will do the job and get you through. So we've been on, I'm uh, checking my little wrist o'clock here, and uh, I've been talking for about um, almost 45 minutes. We have a few minutes, and I ain't gone nowhere. And uh, Steve, can you help us out here? Maybe the guys have a question or two they'd like to raise. Yes, yeah, so why don't we uh, ask, uh, there's a, a chat box over here. If you have a question, uh, you can uh, type on the chat box or you can let me know that you want to ask a question and I'll unmute you. But if I'm afraid if I unmute everybody, we're going to have trouble <laughs> with too many questions at the same time. Uh, this is my first, first time doing a presentation. I'm extremely nervous. Okay. Uh, Steve, is that one for me, the nervous one? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, let me um, let me see what I can do to help, to help you out. First of all, you don't want to eliminate nervousness uh, totally. Uh, I'm going to surprise you by telling you, I got a little revved up here. So I said, maybe I'm really, honestly, and truly, before I started this thing, I said, Maybe uh, I didn't expect to have the participants on, plus of the uh, mentors. Maybe I'm not prepared. I started to get a little bent out of shape with myself. 
So I get nervous too, but the good news about that is the, don't be afraid of being nervous because that means the adrenaline is working. Uh, and when the adrenaline is working, you can overcome a, a, an awful lot. Uh, one thing about it, one thing you can do is start early. As soon as I knew, as soon as I agreed to do a presentation at LDI, I started working on it. And segment your practice sessions. Write a little bit one day. Uh, polish it down another day. Get another article on it another day. When you spread it out, you want to involve your mind and your body in the talk over a period of time. I would much rather have you put in, uh, you have busy schedule, I'm sure, but if you put in only 10 or 15 minutes a day after dinner or before you go to work or at lunchtime, you're kind of seeding it. You're helping your presentation grow in your mind. Uh, if you only, if you put in the marathon, and I, I, I've worked with students on this for decades, so don't do it as a marathon because you don't have time to seed it into your brain. Your brain works in networking, and the brain works on reinforcement. So a little at a time, a little at a time, and also I mentioned before, I don't if you can get any kind of recording equipment that you can put in your car. A tape record or use a that's obsolete now, but record on some kind of equipment and play it in your car. I get it on a CD, play it in your car to and from work, and dispersing your practice sessions and your study session sessions. What will happen? On take my word for it and tell me after you give it. You're going to find that it's kind of like deja vu. It's like you're already there. Another thing I should mention on the deja vu is visualize, and I can't see anything, but I know a number of you, and I'm trying to, I'm looking at a blank screen. That's the most discouraging, awful thing in the world, but I know the guys, and I'm just visualizing you, and I'm hoping I'm saying something of value. So the guy who asked about the nervousness, visualize your audience. There's a whole school of thought about this, visualizing. Everything from Babe Ruth visualizing and telling the guys, telling me where he was going to hit the home run. Well, visualizing is very, very powerful. So distribute learning, distribute listening, distribute, distribute practicing, and your honest enthusiasm when you get the thing, you, it's going to feel like you were there before. Yeah. One, per one, person, one yes. person once told me <clears throat> that to get over your nervousness, when you look out at the audience, just pictured them all naked. Yeah, that, uh, I see you naked. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a gimmick. It works for some people. Yeah, I have, there's a couple more questions. Okay, let's go. Let's move it. How do you get away from reading your notes? Okay, the way you get to reading your notes is very similar. There's two, a couple of suggestions. The suggestions I made about nervousness, listening to yourself on, on a CD or any kind of record, recording equipment, uh, and, and immerse yourself in it. And then what you can do is um, reduce your script to bullet points. Uh, just make it, reduce it to little headlines. I mean, it's five minutes, it's not five hours. Uh, you use your intelligence to reduce your script to about eight, 10 points, ideally six, down a page, and 36 points. Uh, my notes are always 36 or 48. If I showed you my notes I've already done for my LDI presentation, November 20, mega, mega notes. And what you do is when you practice, here's how you get away from reading. Go through the thing once. You read it, it's five minutes plus. You read the thing out loud, and then you turn it face down, and then you try to see if you can wing it with your bullet points. The first time, Telephone. Okay, you practice with and without your notes. One time you read it from the script. The second time you go with your bullet points. Now the first time you're teaching yourself. Uh, this is a fine art, but you must do it to be a pro, to be a pro style speaker. Uh, working with your notes is very much like the first time you jumped in the water. You had to be convinced that you wouldn't sink down when you're a little kid learning how to swim. The same thing is true. 
take me at my word. If you jump into going from the script to just bullet notes, you'll be amazed. All of a sudden, after a few tries, from one to the other, you look at your bullet notes and bam, you can whack out the presentation like nothing with uh, hardly any notes and you just glance down there what you're entitled to. Uh, you don't, nothing to be uncomfortable about, but you won't need much copy. Next question, Steve, let's move. Over. Next question. Will the mentors get a list of the presentations in his room? I can answer that. Yes, they will. I've already seen a preliminary list. Okay. All right. Uh, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, one guy said, I have submitted my presentations to my mentor and have not heard back uh, if my presentations are on target. So I have your name written down and I'll check into it. Uh, let's see. What do we have? We have more. Very helpful. Thank you. Every smartphone can record audio and get presentation as usual. There you go. So yeah. you, you got a good phone, that's all you need. Play, and you keep playing, playing that thing again and again on the way to the work. You'll know this thing cold. You got a script, you got bullet points, and you got your, and you got your iPhone, and you're in business. That's, a, that's right. And that's from one of our uh, tech gurus uh, in our organization. Great. Okay. Uh, agreed. Bert is always a pleasure to learn from. There we go. Uh, is there any other, any more questions? Excellent session this evening. Thank you for doing this. Steve, we're... Okay, so uh, in a few minutes, we have the Yellow Candle uh, podcast. So if anybody uh, wanted to go see that, uh, you probably should get off and go prepare to get into that. Uh, do you have anything else, Bert, that you'd like to uh, provide? Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's a, been a genuine pleasure, and I sincerely hope that uh, whatever I share with you will help you both be a uh, good mentor and a good speaker. Thanks so much, and bye now. Wonderful. Thank